Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the fourth Budget Invites webinar hosted by ODI and University of Oslo HISP Center. Today's discussion will focus on whether education management information systems, also known as EMIS, can improve education spending. My name is Ole Homonchuk. I'm a research fellow at ODI, and I'm delighted to welcome you and our expert speakers, whom I will introduce in a moment. Throughout the event, please feel free to share your reflections and questions in the Q&A box. I think we can all agree that having access to timely and relevant data is a prerequisite for evidence-informed decision-making. However, government stakeholders face challenges in using education data systems for policy and budget decisions. Data often lacks granularity, timeliness, and credibility to provide useful insights. This is especially the case when we're trying to track and understand how public and donor spending is influencing learning outcomes. Moreover, many education data platforms are not user-friendly, deterring stakeholder engagement, particularly at the school, local, and regional levels. Even though significant challenges remain, there are many examples of good practice and efforts to improve education and finance data systems. As such, our webinar today aims to highlight positive developments in the field while acknowledging remaining challenges. To do so, today we're going to explore questions such as, what should the role of EMIS be in improving public education spending? How should EMIS user needs influence thinking around the design of integrated data platforms? Furthermore, other examples of good practice um, on interoperability between EMIS and PFM systems in low and middle income countries. To help us navigate these questions, it is my privilege to introduce our speakers today. Our first speaker will be Knut Staring, who is a senior advisor at the University of Oslo HISP Center. Knut is going to set the scene by showcasing why we should employ ecosystems thinking and participatory approach when setting up or reforming education formation systems. Following note, we're going to hear from Alistair Fraser, who will provide reflections on demand and supply for education data from the perspective of finance ministries. Alistair has extensive track record of researching PFM systems and is currently an independent consultant with ODI, Global Partnership for Education, and Oxford Policy Management. Furthermore, we're delighted to have Becky Mpanza, who is the Chief Director at the Department of Basic Education in South Africa. Becky is going to share practical insights on implementing reform ideas into practice, highlighting the importance of changing mindsets around data systems and creating genuinely collaborative environments. Then we'll have Nelsiwi Dalmani, who is the Acting AMIS Manager at the Ministry of Education and Training in the Kingdom of Iswatini. Similarly to Becky, uh, she, will, she has extensive practical experience in MS and PFM reforms and will showcase recent developments using unique student identifiers. Last but not least, we will hear from Hannah Graham, who is the Managing Director at CGA Technologies. Hannah has experience in work in extensive work experience in low middle income countries, including Sierra Leone. Her presentation will highlight the need for harmoni um, harmonizing data structures, moving away from annual data cycles, decentralization, and our themes. Without further ado, I will hand over to Knut to kick off the discussion. Thank you very much, um, Olya. I will try to share my screen. Is it visible now? Yes. OK, thank you. Yes, so so hello everyone. Uh, we are very happy as, as the HISP Center at the University of Oslo to be a part of this discussion. We feel that it is crucial to, to link uh, the administrative side uh, within the line ministries uh, with the Ministry of Finance and, 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 um, and public financing uh, in general is, is such a crucial topic. So uh, what I wanted to highlight is the approach that we have taken through um, extensive action research over actually a couple of decades at the, the Department of Informatics at the University of Oslo, uh, in term, in, which focuses on um, sustainable implementations of management information systems. 
and EMIS is is, is a uh, key um, example, of course. Uh, although a lot of our research has taken place within the health sector, so HMIS, Health Management Information Systems, we think that there are um, very uh, similar uh, uh, issues that uh, face both sectors, and there's a lot to learn from the sectors. Uh, looking at what the, what the others have been doing and also even uh, concrete synergies within uh, a specific country or even a local level setting. So uh, the approach that we have um, really done a lot of research on uh, over the last decade, I would say, is, is the platform approach. And of course, we all know uh, big uh, social media platforms such as uh, Facebook and um, uh, and and uh, uh, Amazon and, and and so many others, uh, but we think that this is really applicable as well in the management information space, and it's actually key to afford the flexibility that is really needed for uh, to to support ministries' uh, needs as they change, because we know this is not a static world we live in, and um, ministries and uh, system owners need to be able to change their systems. Uh, and it cannot just uh, go with something that was developed once and and um, uh, by some consultant who is maybe not even um, available in the long term. So if I can manage to go to my next slide. Yeah. So we actually wrote a background paper for the um, Global Education Monitoring Report, which is an annual report that UNESCO publishes every year. So last year, we, we wrote this paper uh, outlining uh, the concept of a digital platform ecosystem. And uh, this is, of course, uh, freely available. And I'll, I'll just try to summarize a little bit of the key concepts. So at the core is the core, core of the platform, which uh, should be uh, very stable, especially in terms of the interfaces that it offers to the world. Um, it should have sufficient. Um, uh, functionality that it's actually attractive and can support uh, again the, the core functional uh, the core needs of the um, EMIS unit uh, within the ministry, uh, as well as 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 the needs of development partners and uh, ideally also uh, other other ministries and the government planning process in general. And then on top of this platform core, uh, the uh, there is this. Um, API that allow and also also um, various technical components that allow people to relatively rapidly build custom applications that can can serve a, a range of uh, functionalities and a range of needs within the um, within various organizations, primarily the government, but but also NGOs and and other other partners uh, and. Having the, this platform um, interface open and well documented enables a range of contributors, be they um, ministries themselves, if they have the technical capacity, or uh, consultants, or um, large, large organizations such as, uh, well, in health, you will have PSI, WHO, in education, UNESCO could build something. Um, so that is the core, the technical core. But as you see in this picture, the technical part is just a third of what we focus on because we think it's really important that the, the software has a vibrant community around it, which certainly includes the Ministry of Education and the EMIS unit, uh, but also the developer um, community, as well as, as, as the broader uh, user, user community. And Part of the function of the community is to support each other, uh, uh, and that is then becomes then the part of the, the capacity building, which is done through formal training, uh, uh, ideally uh, university collaborations, uh, but also also uh, more dedicated workshops. And again, with the the core of the platform being completely open, uh, this uh, this enables uh, various uh, contributors. Also, when it comes to uh, you know um, creating training materials, uh, running courses, etc. So so it 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 all becomes an ecosystem of apps that you can uh, install on top of the platform core, 
but also an ecosystem of um, of people that includes people and includes uh, various institutions that uh, collaborate. So all of this allows us to uh, look even beyond the, the the ministries and also beyond the individual schools. And 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 actually, we think it with UNESCO. We feel that it's really important to empower what we call what they call the middle tier. Which is, you know, everything in between the national and the very uh, and the institution. So basically, the district, the ins school inspectors, uh, the head teachers also uh, are 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 really key when it comes to edu um, education data flows and actual actual use of data where uh, things um, where, when where there's a potential to actually make decisions that matter sort of real time. Uh, and also, this seems to be less in the education sector than health uh, of, of this local routine use of data for uh, evidence-based decision. So we, we think having uh, giving people access not only to enter their data as they are, um, you know, um, compelled to do by, by the central level, uh, by the ministry, but also enabling them to look and use their own, uh, look at and use their own data um, for for their own day-to-day um, -day, uh, work is really powerful. And of course, we want the different departments within the education sector to speak to each other and, and share, uh, share uh, a system. Again, the platform modularity allows for this. It allows also different people to have the access to different data um, as, as is uh, appropriate. So uh, I did want to include this picture of a community because it's so important to us. Um, uh, and uh, having again a solid platform and a, and a, and a well-defined data um, architecture allows uh, for various actors to build uh, a number of different outputs. So we see here, for example, a map and a few uh, key uh, performance indicators, uh, as well as as a, an, um, uh, an, uh, a mobile app for for attendance taking. All of this very different types of uses of data, also different uh, frequency, different uh, audiences uh, can be um, can be linked to a shared platform and, and thus you can uh, harvest a lot of synergies. So these are the dimensions for scaling that we outline and we, we um, in the report. And uh, basically we think that uh, you should probably not try to go in all these directions at the same time, but we, Feel that it's very important to uh, to make sure we have uh, wide coverage uh, that uh, that uh, all the different actors can actually use the system. We had already touched on decentralization. Of course, integration is is key with other other um, uh, ministries, especially finance. And 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 then uh, how do you how often do you actually need uh, and want to collect data? That, depends on the types of data, but we think that frequency should probably be more often than, than just the annual school census. And then, of course, if you really want uh, um, good data on, on what's actually happening, you, you need to make that shift towards individual students, individual staff, and, and, and appropriate data about, uh, about all of them, while keeping um, in mind that you don't want to overburden the, the people uh, at the school level uh, and then at the district level that uh, will collect this data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Knut. Um, that was really, really interesting. Next, we're going to hand over to Alistair. Um, great. So thanks for that. So I'm just going to go quickly through um, sort of reflecting on some of the uh, uh, points that uh, Knut has raised and and from a kind of you know one of the important customers in government for EMIS data is is the Ministry of Finance um, so when you know we did a, a few about a couple of years ago with um, uh, other colleagues from ODI and we kind of came up with sort of key um, kind of key aspects of that so when when we're looking at you know the quality of data for kind of decision making in finance we're looking at sort of credible data which is often a big issue um, although it depends on the country in terms of, you know, if you look at EMIS data relative to household survey data, it doesn't always match up. Uh, we're also looking, you know, to Knut's point about sort of 
you know, ministries of finance do need to do more in terms of stepwise data. So some schools will produce more information than other schools. Some districts will produce more information than other districts. And the districts with the, the least good information might need the most money. So we need to, on the finance side, we do need to come up with ways of, of accounting for that. Um, we're also looking at, um, as, as Knut uh, alluded to, the kind of scope, um, you know, the scope of the data um, ministries of ed, ed, uh, ministries of finance typically, you know, help ministries of education use enrollment data, um, but you know we should be more interested in sort of the efficiency of of the sector, the education sector as well. It's a major uh, spender in most countries, or in virtually all countries, and um, obviously the ministry of finance is interested in producing, you know, people who complete secondary school um, and people who who learn you know, the basics. And that's something that, that requires, an, you know, to monitor that requires more accurate information. And one of the best ways to get more accurate information is to kind of, you know, increase the amount of information that schools can use. So a lot of the traditional illnesses that I've seen over the past kind of 12 years in kind of about a dozen countries, you know, it, it is very much aimed at the kind of annual census report that the, the Ministry of Education produces. And the information collected isn't always useful for schools or sent back to schools or fed back for, to schools, even in countries with very sophisticated and real kind of intention behind the remus efforts. And then the third thing we're looking for on top of the credibility and scope is kind of an interoperability. So whether the data collected by the Ministry of Education works with the HR system and government so we can uh, cross-check uh, you know, where teachers are, whether they're attending the right schools at post, um, and and also whether it can be you know used with other information from you know NGOs and outside the sector, which might cover things like um, learning, you know, the quality of schools, essentially the quality of what's happening in schools. Um, on the demand side, you know, the the budget cycle can you know consists of four stages. Um, the main stage we use information at at the moment is when we're coming up with the budgets. Virtually every country uses some enrollment data when they kind of. Um, allocates uh, money between schools um, and then at the approval stage of the budget when the budget reaches parliament there's actually very little that there's a lot of kind of ambition around that and there's very little that actually happens in parliaments um, but it is another kind of important stage where ideally there would be some emis um, input available or some sort of more sector information so that um, you know more people can understand the budget um, on the execution side, we're interested in using EBIS data to look at the results of the sector um, to try and link financing to um, to sector results. But that has a very mixed history. It's often very donor driven. It's very very difficult to get right. Uh, it's something that high income countries rarely do. Uh, and we also look at um, leak leakages. So whether you know whether teachers are missing, whether the money is missing, you know EBIS data can be helpful for that. Um, but again, it comes back to the, the integrity of this data and, and that comes back to basically whether schools ever get the chance to use any of the data, whether they see any point in, in, in putting in accurate data in the system. Uh, and then evaluation is clearly a stage, the kind of final stage of the budget. Um, and that's a stage where, you know, the EMIS data and the other data in the sector effects is crucially important, but it's But that's so that's that's my kind of brief remarks on that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alistair. Thank you. Now our next speaker is Becky, who is going to give insight on reforms in South Africa. Becky, are you there? Thank you very much, uh, Ola. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear and see your slides. Okay, thanks very much for the opportunity. Let me put it on a slideshow. Yeah. No, thanks very much for the opportunity um, uh, uh, to sh share our 
our experience in terms and and and, and analysis and publication, we started this journey uh, in to, of developing the the the, the policy in two thousand and four. In fact, we gazetted in two thousand and four. Then we developed the policy in uh, two thousand and eight. Started with the implementation in twenty seventeen. Uh, so really, also. I would like to thank uh, Sophia and uh, her team in the way in which they are supporting MS uh, to move away from surveys, but to collect unit uh, record information. Here is the outline of the presentation, but I won't talk to all the slides. I will just uh, highlight uh, our experience uh, uh, regarding MS. Maybe before I go to uh, my presentation, let me share with you uh, the shape and size of the basic education uh, in South Africa. As you can see, we've got 13.4 million learners. Uh, in terms of the size, we've got uh, the highest, I mean, the biggest uh, size, uh, the biggest province in terms of enrollment is KwaZulu Natal with 2.8 learners, followed by Houghton and Eastern Cape. The, 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 uh, maybe let me define uh, MS. MS plays a crucial role in providing accurate and timely data for public finance management, enabling informed decision making, reducing administrative burdens, and improving the coherence and timeliness of PFM of public finance management processes. The current MS strategy is to collect unit record data. As I indicated that we started this journey uh, uh, in 2008 to develop the system. From We, we collect unit record uh, information from the first grade to the last one and track the movement of each learner from school to school throughout the learner's school career. The unit record system marks significant change in the way in which the MS collects data to support planning, monitoring, decision making in the sector. The vision of the integrated management information system is that all data should be collected from a single source system at the institutional level to provide a single entry point of truth. What we mean by that is that uh, whether you you are in examination, whether you're in scholar transport, whether you are dealing with all the programs in the school, the source must be single. That's the vision that is uh, in our MS policy. Here are the benefits of moving away from collecting aggregated information through surveys forms into a unit record information and tracking system. Firstly, is to reduce the cost of school data collection and limitation of storage space and processing time by different levels in the education sector. I remember when we were still uh, running surveys with those papers where to get storage, to store those question papers, uh, I mean, those uh, questionnaires, so really it was a nightmare. Also, the this system, it also allows us to increase the frequency of data collections and accessibility of data. Because at the moment, we are collecting data twice uh, per year. Whereas when we're, we're running surveys, we're only doing one survey per year, which was called annual school census. But now we're able to collect this data twice per year, and our intention is to collect this data on a quarterly basis. But in provinces, as we as you see, you saw there, uh, provinces, some of them, they do collect the, the data on a monthly basis. So this increases the frequency of data collections and accessibility, and also improve the efficiency of data of educational institutions. So the system that we have uh, in South Africa that we, 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 we use, uh, uh, where we host this data is called Learner Unit Record Information and Tracking System, or NURITS. And it 
allocate unique number to each and every land. As I, I've already covered that the, the policy was gazetted in 2004. The strategic direction of MS, in order to move towards this new strategy, here are the priorities that we agreed upon as a, as a, as a country. Firstly, was to say we must have a school administration system in each and every school. So this software was is provided free of charge by government to all the schools so that uh, principals can be able to manage schools uh, using uh, this software called SSMs. SSMs stand for South African School Administration and Management System. So this is the, the single source at the school level to support the business process at the school level. Then at the national level, which we can call it a central warehouse, then it's a, it's a, a national unit record information and tracking system. As I covered this point that we started developing this system in 2008, but the implementation was only in 2017 because we had to run a parallel uh, process so as to ensure that the new system uh, was able to fulfill the, 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 the needs of the department. Then the, the other priority that we agreed upon was uh, that we must have a reporting layer, which is a, a business uh, intelligence uh, reporting system. Then the last one, which is very crucial if you are running EMIS, because EMIS data is self-reported. In other words, principals are telling us about what's happening in their schools. So it's, uh, you, you must have a, a way of verifying that data. So we have what you call data quality audits. That's where you do a sample of schools. Then you send them an independent service provider who will go do a physical head count just to, to check the data was provided through a system and check the warm bodies that are there at the school level. This area, this point is very, very important. So here's the output of uh, our MS strategy. The LURID system is able to provide master list of all schools in the country. And we publish twice, we publish the master list in our website so that even the members of the public can uh, go and verify whether the school is, is legitimate or not. Also to provide accurate record of learner numbers in all relevant education institutions. Provide accurate profile of individual learners in and living the education system. So we're able to track uh, the movement of learners and, and the dropouts. Provide an accurate profile of individual learners progression in the system, the patterns and trends of learner progression in the system, the rate of patterns, intra and inter-school provincial transfers. So we, can, we were able even to track migration of learners. Also, the last point there, integration with other government systems. At the moment, we are integrating with, with home affairs because home affairs, it's where everybody uh, uh, is supposed to register there as a citizen. So we're able to uh, uh, verify the data that you get from schools with the systems from uh, Department of Home Affairs. But I will deal with that point at a, a, a later stage. So as I indicated earlier on, the vision which is in our policy is that all data should be collected from a single source system at the institutional level to provide a single entry point of truth. But then all operational and transversal system must be built on top of this institutional system. That's the, your BI, your BI system that will be able to provide a, 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 a report. Here are the things that we also we had to do as MEs was to develop education information standards. 
we also publish them in our website uh, where, where people police are free to download and see the first one is data dictionary because the data dictionary it's important that even uh, a statistical agency when they run a survey they are, when they define a school when they define the dropout we use the same dictionary also we have the master list standard in terms of the format of the master list standard what should be there and when it should be uh, published we also have the publication standard that defines uh, what is need to be covered by the publication like your glossary definitions uh, also data uh, quality standards with data coding and levels of verifications. These are the education information standards that we, we had to develop as EMIS. Coming back to collaboration, you know, the this system really created an opportunity for us to link with uh, other government departments that are providing services to the learners. So that's why we call it holistic data-driven support for children. Firstly, if you look at home affairs, the civil registration, identification of individuals, that's where we're able to even identify those learners that need to be provided with ID. In other words, that need to be uh, re registered in the country uh, uh, through this collaboration. We're also collaborating with Department of Social Development to identify those uh, vulnerable children who are supposed to be supported by government and we share that data uh, with, 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 with social development. Also, we're in the process of finalizing the protocol with Department of Home Affairs so that you can be able to track teenage pregnancy. Achieving all these uh, colleagues uh, is with challenges. The first challenge is connectivity at the school level, administration support staff at the school level, because to run a school administration system, you need to have a person dedicated to work on the system. You, and data utilization uh, at a uh, circuit and district level, because we spend a lot of money collecting data. So really it does not make sense if people are not utilizing the data. Uh, the last one is IT skills at the school uh, level. So here is just the notes that I, I thought I should share with uh, the meeting in terms of how EMIS can assist in public finance management. So, the first point is that EMIS can do that by supplying data to PFM system, including budget formulation, policy costings, and allocation methodologies. Interoperability with other government data sets to ensure seamless integration of data across different systems. As I indicated, the department that we're really working closely in terms of sharing uh, data uh, in that fashion, it's Department of Home Affairs. We also work closely with National Treasury because for tre for provinces to get a, 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 a equitable share allocation, in other words, money from government, uh, they need to provide accurate statistics. So they send those statistics to us, we verify them, then we send to National Treasury. Uh, the real-time data collection for timeliness and credibility. We are not at this stage uh, because uh, our system is not web-based, but we are moving towards that now as we are currently using in the process of uh, developing, uh, I mean, uh, embarking on customizing open EMIS uh, using our SSM's data. So uh, we, we are moving toward that direction, but it's much better than when we're running service because it used to take us about eight months to collect data. 
and to publish it. But now, as I indicated, uh, uh, provinces on a quarterly basis, they're able to, 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 to collect data, but you need a real-time collection for timeliness and credibility. Leveraging demand for school for passive data collection, verification of data collected from school to ensure accuracy, promoting the use of data by providing easy comparison and information, I mean, informing policy decisions. And remember, MIS really, the collection of data should be also be guided by assisting the business process of, of education. In other words, to support the policy implementation at the school level. Uh, also, uh, monitoring expenditure to ensure effective and efficient use of funds. You know, in our system, uh, it's just that uh, I'm not presenting a system at the moment, but we have different modules. One of them is on finance. So this is the module that we use to monitor expenditure at the school level. Performance evaluation of education programs and policies. Through this uh, system that we are using, we're able even to major uh, learner performance on a quarterly basis. Transparency and accountability in public finance management, planning and policy development based on data analysis, resource optimization by identifying areas of need and access. You see, with a, a unit record information system, it's possible to do that because you are able even to identify vulnerable children. Uh, you are able to identify schools that need more resources. Grant allocation based on specific needs and requirements, tracking and monitoring of education expenditure, as I indicated that uh, the, the, there's a module dealing with finance. Revenue generation through data analysis, performance assessment of provincial government in managing education funds, monitoring and evaluation of education programs and initiatives, equity and fairness in the resource allocations. This is very critical in South Africa because as we know our history, you still have uh, schools that really need more funding than the others. That's why then uh, uh, we're able to uh, identify those schools that we call as quintile one, quintile two, quintile three. Those are no fee schools. In other words, learners in those schools, they don't pay uh, school fees. So this is through tracking uh, the allocation of resources using uh, our system. Checking grant disbursements to ensure funds reach intended uh, reception recipients. So with the, the we've got various grants that are issued by government to provinces. Like one of them deals with uh, maths and science. The other ones deal with ECT, deals with HIV, AIDS. So those are the uh, grants that are were able to assist in managing that uh, they are used uh, efficiently in provinces. The last slide, it's monitoring demographic trends for long-term planning. We work closely with Statistics South Africa here to, to ensure that we are able to monitor uh, uh, demographic trends. In other words, to identify where schools need to be built uh, 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 in future so that we don't build a school in an area where uh, in future there will be no people living in that area. Supporting evidence-based decision-making, tracking utilization of resources and identifying gaps or inefficiencies and ensuring transparency and accountability in public finance uh, management. Uh, uh, in short, colleagues, uh, these are the things that I think is especially based on unit record information system, can be able to uh, support public finance management. Thank you very much, uh, Ola. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, very important points on how if we're spending so much time and effort, then data really has to be useful on the ground and um, how much effort it takes to create, you know, 
improvement and how long. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Nelsive and hear about Iswatini. Becky, if you could please stop sharing the slides, that'll be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ola. I, I hope it's okay if I don't share my video. I'm, I'm just in an awkward position. And thank you for to Peggy and the previous Fraser for for the points they've made. And what I've noted from what we're doing is that it is very important to ensure that whatever MS is producing and giving to the public, it should be something, it should be data that is timely because for us to inform on budget formulation or allocation, we must have relevantly timely data and the data should be covering a broad scope and individual is best to inform on, on, the, on the budget formulation and allocation. And mostly importantly, it should be information that is credible, that is valid to support whatever decisions that government will be making. So for us, uh, it's almost similar thing to what Peggy was saying, moving from um, aggregate based reporting to, to individual. And so for the longest time we've been reporting on aggregate based and the only contribution that we've been making to the Ministry of Finance in terms of budgeting or to our ministry, it's only in providing total number of learners and teachers so as to guide their budgeting, but it wasn't to inform on how they should budget. That I think it should be made clear. So in, in 2018, uh, the Ministry of Education with Ministry of Finance, uh, they had to ensure that uh, free primary education grants uh, distributed to schools are accountable and they are managed. So they introduced what they call, uh, they introduced a system whereby the ministry uh, and the schools, they had to go through um, verifying a learner PIN. For us, a PIN or an ID, it's a personal identification number, which is given to an individual when they are born at, at from Ministry of Home Affairs. Uh, it's bed registration with the PIN. So it's I, it's unique and just for that individual. And if you have people coming in the country, be it refugees or foreigners to work, they are given that PIN, which is just for them to use. So they the schools had to use PIN to verify if the learner is really active, alive, and in that particular school, registered in that particular school. And from doing that, it meant the school verifies and the accounts from the ministry, they have to verify that PIN too before the grants are, di are distributed and given to schools. And that usually took a long time. You'd find a school receiving their um, capitation grants the following year when they are supposed to be uh, paying for operation, operation operations uh, cost. So that was a problem. Then uh, in 2020, um, they approached the MS unit to say, instead of doing this, you have access to schools every day. Uh, you collect information from schools. Can we move to a lower level so that we can cut the time taken to verify and the time taken for schools to receive their grants. Uh, so then for MS, we then had to shift from aggregate to individual. And for us to do that, we approached, which is what we're currently doing now and trying to customize DHIS2 for education, which is um, led by the, the University of Oslo with the other his group. So we worked with HISP Uganda and UIO in the formulation and uh, customization for that to the country specific need. Uh, currently, we are doing that. And in 2022, we registered all learners that were in schools and we are tracking those learners 
and teachers in those schools using the pin. Uh, yes, not everyone, not every learner has a pin in the country because of the, how Eswatini is situated, were, were surrounded by South Africa and Mozambique. So those learners along the South African border lines, which is about 20%, you find that they want to have double citizenship, so they don't have. But then for those 20%, because we are tracking them, we are able to forward the names, forward the, the guardian information to the Ministry of uh, the Deputy Prime Minister's office where there are social welfare offices to easily follow up on that and ensure that every learner has the pin. So that is how we're planning and we're hoping that by next year, it will be, we, it will, we will be fully supporting the, especially the primary education level in distributing them the free primary education grants to schools. And also because uh, for the FPE grants to be distributed, it, we also need to be able to manage the teaching and learning materials being distributed to schools. For them to budget and their budget to be approved, uh, the MS unit, I think, will play a huge role in ensuring that, one, the allocation of funds is valid and true and it's not wasted in any other system, the link, the leakages that were there, they shouldn't be there. So we're linking up with the Ministry of Home Affairs to verify the pins for learners, and we're also linking with the Ministry of Health through the budgeting side to say that this is the number of learners in the country, and this is their, their profiles, especially that's another thing that we want to emphasize on, that if you have a special education need learner, their needs will be different from a normal learner. So we also want to influence that through the profile, the learner profiles that we'll be collecting using the system. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's it all. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very insightful. Hannah, over to you. Thank you very much. One second while I share my screen. Lovely to be with you all today. Uh, I'm going to be uh, joined on the call by Muniru Kawa and Sheriff Conti, my colleagues, uh, who will be available to also answer any questions. And they are dialing in today from our free town office, where I'm going to talk to you a little bit about education and data, education data in Sierra Leone and its role in PFM. And we're looking particularly at lessons that can be learned from a system called WDR. So just giving you a brief bit of context, um, in Sierra Leone, there have been significant um, progressions in recent years uh, following the introduction a few years ago of free quality school education, which introduced free secondary schooling. There was a massive influx in uh, primary and secondary enrollment. And then more recently, um, policy frameworks, um, including the radical inclusion policy, which focused on uh, significant increase of access. It's worth noting that in Sierra Leone there's been a significant emphasis on uh, being data friendly and on putting data at the heart of decision making. However, it's also worth flagging that data systems in Sierra Leone continue to be fragmented. Um, that's They're fragmented between institutions, so Sierra Leone has a teaching service commission and a ministry of a basic uh, education as well, among, amongst other institutions. Um, and also, of course, as we've discussed already, the Ministry of Finance, but they're also fragmented within institutions as well. Uh, so we have different directorates in some of those institutions um, collecting different data sets in different places. 
uh, and at primary and secondary level and of course um, along donor lines as well where, where certain uh, initiatives get funded uh, and others don't. Um, a key a key uh, challenge, which I think has been discussed already, is the lack of an agreed uh, harmonized data structure, um, which a number of others have referred to already today, uh, could include a, a data dictionary. Um, Sierra Leone does have uh, a document um, that's set out as a data dictionary, but this is not something which would uh, comprehensively allow uh, the, 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 or set out a, a clear data structure that, that different uh, management information systems could could use. So I wanted to give you a sense of recent work uh, on on various systems in the education sector. This um, this doesn't reflect um, uh, work that is done elsewhere on uh, the annual school census, but we will very much touch on that in this as well. Um, what I'd wanted to do in the spirit of showing rather than telling was showing you um, a sort of a, a mapping of the different um, education systems that have been uh, developed or different uh, data uh, initiatives that have uh, been going on in Sierra Leone over the years. Some, that was set out by EdTech Hub, but it was actually um, too big to fit on a slide. So um, let me just uh, leave, leave that point as it is. Um, However, uh, the, the, the new Minister for Education in Sierra Leone um, highlights the importance of uh, consolidating what's already in place and building upon that. So I, I wanted to uh, speak to you um, kind of in that spirit. Um, so recent work to harmonize and build on uh, some of the existing data collection efforts in the education space. Um, Disclosure, these are all uh, systems that, that CGA has, has, has worked on. So initially, uh, the teacher records management system, um, that was introduced a few years ago, and uh, it, it essentially uh, digitized teacher HR records um, and then harmonized this with the payroll data that was managed by the Ministry of Finance. Um, now, the reason I flag this and, and the reason that that digitization of the hard copy personnel files is, is really important is that there's a lot of information contained in there, uh, such as, you know, letter of first appointment, date of birth and so on, that are critical for things like retirement planning, which is, of course, an important part of um, managing the, the workforce pipeline. Um, and also uh, areas such as, you know, teacher qualifications to ensure that, you know, we have a qualified workforce in place in Sierra Leone. Um, this teacher records management system was essentially subsumed more recently in a much more comprehensive teacher management information system, a, a TEMIS, uh, that was launched last month um, and is being rolled out, as, as mentioned by um, my colleague Sharif and others who are on the call today. And that uh, comprises of essentially a central um, management information system for all teacher uh, management functions. So with uh, each module of the TMIS is managed by a directorate in the Teaching Service Commission, and it has components such as um, teacher recruitment, registration and licensing, continuous professional development, grievance and redress mechanism, and so on. But the one I want to touch on with you today is a school reporting tool called WIDIA. Uh, and the reason for that is that essentially what WIDIA does is takes all of the information, give or take, or key key data um, that's, that's held at central level uh, down to the schools and essentially supplements it, verifies that data and supplements it. So uh, I'll we'll get into more detail about what I mean on that in a second. Um, but WIDIA as a school reporting tool uh, has individual um, learner enrollment and daily attendance data, as well as the teacher attendance data of all working teachers, not just government paid or payroll teachers. Uh, that's been rolled out to 300 schools across Sierra Leone uh, so far in all 16 districts uh, and the, the Ministry and the Teaching Service Commission are, are in discussions right now to continue the scale up. So zooming in a little more on WIDIA, uh, as mentioned, there's an emphasis on daily disaggregated data on learners and on teachers. 
Um, this is a key thing to flag is that this is not just uh, data flowing up from the school to district level and into central level, but this is also um, supporting schools to digitize data for their own use as well. So that, that can all be viewed and managed and used at school level as well. Um, although it's not um, a comprehensive school MIS um, as, as you would uh, on, on, a, on a laptop as you would have um, in, in other contexts, not at this point. So um, what I really wanted to flag here with WIDIA is that the starting point um, for en enrollment and data collection at the school is existing data. Um, so the way that it works is that uh, we DIA, the team uh, who are on this call, um, gather data from the annual school census or the EMIS. Um, they take teacher payroll data from the IFMIS um, and the, the TMIS and uh, essentially take that to schools and ask school leaders to verify uh, teacher payroll um, updating uh, the, the records on whether teachers are available and then enrolling digitally all learners. And of course, as others have mentioned, that's important because in Sierra Leone as well, the learner enrollment does inform the school grants. Um, the platform is also used by education officials um, who are at district levels in, across multiple uh, agencies. So the TSC and the ministry. Um, have access to uh, this platform and uh, they are uh, asked to to verify data that's entered at the school level as well which is I mean, something uh, Becky mentioned earlier. Um, then of course uh, the uh, this is this information is all housed on a dashboard website and used for uh, planning and policy purposes but then there's also critically a public website as well which houses um, and displays anonymized uh, information, including of teacher attendance at each school. So showing, you know, teachers and learners and their attendance, but of course, without providing any uh, identities. So the, a key focus is on um, making as much information public, um, but but securing and, and uh, making sure that, you know, any personal data is, of course, protected. Just giving you a glimpse of uh, what uh, WIDIA looks like. On the left, we have um, the front page, uh, the, the welcome page, um, which shows uh, sort of daily reporting. And on the right, in particular, uh, a school profile. Um, and so that's, or a glimpse at a school profile, showing you know a selection of learners, um, teacher attendance, and so on. Um, there is also class information, uh, and a, a key focus of what we do uh, collects, especially on learners, is uh, looking at them individually. So we have, you know, their bio data, um, their parents and guardians, uh, their special needs or maternal status, um, really uh, trying to create a sort of deeper and richer picture of who the learners are across Sierra Leone in order to provide much more assurance um, on data that is collected. Uh, and really be able to inform education planning by creating a much more detailed picture of the scale and the scope of need across Sierra Leone. So I wanted to give you um, a quick glimpse at findings from WIDIA uh, as far as the 300 school rollout has gone so far. Um, Data findings on the teacher side uh, included some pretty enlightening findings around uh, teachers who are not on government payroll. So over 43% of teachers teaching in government schools are community paid or so-called volunteer teachers. And that even stretches as far as 11% of school leaders. So that's 11% of school leaders of government schools are not uh, government employees in Sierra Leone um, and were previously unknown to the TSE. And this is because the emphasis on WIDIA is on collecting data on all teachers, all working teachers in government schools, not only government payroll teachers. 
there are obviously significant implications or opportunities um, to onboard some of these qualified uh, community paid teachers to, to kind of regularize them, manage them, um, and, and really essentially, you know, by cleansing payroll or creating fiscal space in other ways, trying to onboard them in order that they can be better managed. Of course, there are risks um, when uh, TSC isn't doesn't have full oversight over uh, all teachers in its school. Uh, other findings, including uh, included teacher average attendance, is was high, um, higher for payroll teachers than non-payroll teachers, unsurprisingly, um, but still uh, still relatively high. I think um, but higher than expected, of course, although. During the program so far, um, there were there were significant improvements, of course, um, with teachers knowing that their uh, attendance was being monitored. Um, uh, the average pupil to qualified teacher ratio across um, the 300 schools is one to 74, which is significantly above the standard set by the ministry. Um, it's also worth pointing out, and actually I don't have that number to hand, but um, there were significant differences in um, the findings on this between the annual school census, uh, the pupil to qualify teacher ratio, and the findings of WIDIA. And that's something that I think would really flag going forward and we'll touch on the importance of disaggregated learner data as well. 51% um, of payroll teachers were found not to be in their allocated school. Now, of course, there is a chance that some of those are not teaching at all. Um, it's it's not possible to say without, well, until WIDIA is ruled out in, in all government schools, because as we know, some of those teachers will be in other schools. And indeed, there were findings um, around that um, because some of teachers had moved schools without approval. Um, we also found um, that there are significant savings um, to be uh, gleaned through the cleansing of payroll. Um, and, and a big part of that is actually just um, really cleaning up what, you know, with, with the data that in fact is already there and, and really putting that into action. Um, but there are significant monthly savings as, as shown. Um, WIDIA also found significant uh, learnings on uh, students, on learners themselves. So just maybe to flag in those 300 schools, um, it has data on over 107,000 individual learners. So that's you know, their bio data, their parents. Um, for many of them, uh, data on their special needs or potential maternal status and so on. Um, this greater level of assurance, this disaggregate data um, is really important, not just because as has been discussed, enrollment data in Sierra Leone does comprise uh, part of the calculation for school grants. And so having a greater degree of assurance over the, over the numbers and, and what lies underneath them is, is obviously important. Um, but it's also really important because aggregate data um, we found in, uh, in education systems uh, essentially just masks the reality in a lot of cases. So, you know, it, it is very hard to sort of say confidently what retention in school is if you aren't counting those learners as individuals. You know, if you have um, 50 children in a class at the start of the academic year and 50 at the end of the academic year, if those are 50 entirely different children, but you were only counting them in, in aggregate terms, then of course, um, that that's not uh, you can't speak about that with a great degree of confidence, and of course that's a, a key focus on of this webinar is is looking at that granularity. So, um, preaching to the converted here, I realise. Um, but I think what we really wanted to flag is that the additional potential uh, for what you can achieve with that granularity is that you can really start to build that richer picture of of what the learners what the learners need, um, who they are, um, how that uh, how that need changes by geography, um, by age, you know, a, a, in order to really plan much better um, education service delivery. 
So uh, of the 40% of learners in Widia who had particularly had their special needs assessed by teachers, um, 25% of them, actually slightly over, were found to have at least some form or degree of special need. Now this is really significant for um, the Teaching Service Commission because they responded to that thinking, well then how are we going to make sure that we have special needs education um, reflected in our in our in our allocation in our workforce allocation and planning how are we going to make sure that we have um, a, a pipeline of teachers who are appropriately trained um, on average learners uh, were absent approximately one out of five days a week um, perhaps not shocking unfortunately um, but uh, it, it by, by starting to measure these things of course um, the intention is to improve those 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 numbers and then um, also unfortunately girls with maternal status attended approximately 50 percent of the time uh, apologies for the big list but we wanted to uh, uh, share with you some some key lessons uh, and reflections that we think are important to to carry forward with this group um, I think as has been mentioned a couple of times already, it's really important to link uh, data on education demand, so on the learners, with data on education supply. Without understanding the detailed needs of learners or and of the, the need in general and, and how that um, how that varies across you know geography in Sierra Leone, you know there are significant um, uh, geographical disparities. Uh, it's really hard to inform service supply and address the significant inequities. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really important in order to understand where to, where to place teachers, where to um, improve the number of qualified teachers um, and what they are, need to be qualified in um, and how to allocate and improve the system around school grants. Um, uh, just you know, to give a couple of examples, of course, this informs um, uh, learning materials and other areas as well, and uh, school supply itself. Um, we wanted to flag that it's particularly important to systematically and regularly collect data at the school and to move beyond the practice of one-off annual census exercises. Um, it's really important to build off existing data sets as a starting point. Now, I noticed this came up in the Q and A. Um, and, and that's where um, we found the benefits from taking payroll data, taking school data from the annual census um, exercise, and then using that as a starting point to take to schools. So that basically when the WIDIA app was taken to school leaders to use, it wasn't just a blank app. It was taken with preloaded with teacher payroll data, with school data from the annual census. Um, and this was this was really important because it, it gave head teachers and local education officials a chance to verify what's already held on there. Um, but then it also uh, helps to create and build that that single source of truth, or in other words, to avoid um, duplicating um, or having issues of version control. Um, as mentioned, disaggregate data really important. We've touched on that already. Um, we need to to move beyond. Uh, you know, essentially just treating children as, as groups of numbers. Um, collecting data on non-payroll teachers, this is really important and it's it's amazing I think how often uh, when we talk about um, teacher data in EMS exercises, I, I know that it, data on non-payroll teachers is often collected but not detailed and not so much that it would actually allow the teaching service commission or ministries in a lot of countries to begin to um you know start to think about managing them and having enough information on them to think about planning to onboard some of them i wanted to flag just from a practical perspective wdia doesn't work alongside government or just with government but it really only works because it is a government system it's it's, it's owned by the government um you know they have the code and it's something that you know while it has been supported um by us you know it's it's been really sort of managed and supported by staff in sierra leone um and really the, the entire operational model 
is to support government in, in managing this and running this and rolling this out. Um, it works nationwide um, without being in all schools, such data is, uh, is really missing an opportunity. Um, you can't show, um, if, you, if, you, if a teacher is missing in one school, you can't prove that they're not in another school if the system is not in that other school. Um, comms and engagement, really wanted to flag this one um, regarding the importance to build buy-in and to mitigate some of the sort of political economic challenges that comes with working um, in this field. Now, we all know that this, is, this, this work involves working across um, different ministries, departments and agencies, you know, ministries of finance, ministries of education, teaching service commission, oftentimes, you know, NCRA or, you know, revenue authorities or other authorities that manage national IDs and so on. Really important to engage all of those relevant MDAs at the start. And um, WIDIA uh, has always been set out as being something that, although it was owned initially by the Teaching Service Commission, um, it was it was it was understood um, uh, from the get go that this was something that the Ministry of Education needed to be a core part of as well, and it needed to be something that was managed by both. Similarly, um, the team uh, and the Teaching Service Commission did a, a huge amount of work um, to engage other stakeholders, so communities, school management committees, and so on, but also teaching unions. Uh, and actually, we were. Uh, really pleasantly surprised at the positive reception from from teachers and from the SLTU uh, at this effort. Wanted to also flag um, the role of IFMIS in the Ministry of Finance. Um, my colleagues Maniru and, and Sharif on here are much better placed to talk about this than I am, but essentially um, issues around free balance and license fees and accessibility in Sierra Leone Free balance is not able to be managed by the TSC directly. There have had to be a number of workarounds, not actually just in education, but also in health. Um, this is a real challenge, but it's 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 necessitated um, systems to essentially be developed to um, make up for this gap and try to bridge this gap. Um, so in, in most cases, um, a lot of this payroll data is being managed in systems outside of 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 free balance and then having to be kind of reported and changes made in accordingly um, so it's really not ideal um, as mentioned harmonization of data structures is key having fragmented systems and so many of them less of a challenge if you have a shared data framework um, with really clear definitions that 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 are comprehensive enough that um, databases management information systems can can use them comprehensively that's really important and lastly, just wanted to flag that really, I mean, the whole point of this, of course, is to improve education service delivery. A key part of that is making sure, as mentioned earlier, that data is not just flowing up one way, but that it, it is putting not just data, but, but really meaningful information at the appropriate levels to inform better decision making and management. So decentralized, supporting the decentralization of, um, of teacher management, of education management. Um, of public financial management so that um, meaningful decisions can be taken at appropriate levels and um, everyone who has access to the information that they need to make those decisions has has it. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to Mira and Sharif, who I think you can't see <laughs> because they're in, in the participant in the uh, attendee list, but um, who are with me in spirit in presenting this. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you to your colleagues. Um, this is incredibly interesting and helpful. We have 15 minutes for the discussion and I'm going to kick off the discussion with a reflection that there is a global learning crisis as you're aware. So children even who are attending are unfortunately oftentimes not learning. And there was a brief comment that Alistair made um, how linking, there's a push from donors to link not only attendance of teachers and students and their needs, but also learning outcomes, reading and writing skills, and link that to finance. Um, have you seen good practice on this? Because Alistair mentioned that there's mixed results. Why or why not it is supported by local stakeholders? 
I mean, it's especially interesting given that in a global kind of North and OECD countries, that's not as common to link learning outcomes with financing. So this is an open question to all the speakers. Um, Hannah, if you want to provide your reflections, very welcome. Um, yeah, I think maybe just to say, I think that's that's the logical next step. Um, I mean, th this example from Sierra Leone, that's certainly the logical next step. And um, I mean, the, the platform is actually doing something similar and is, is including learning outcomes with some similar work in Mali. But but yeah, it, it's I, I, I'll defer to others who have more experience on, of that, of implementing that in particular. Alistair, do you want to come in? I want to put you, I'm putting you on the spot. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously, a, it's an ambition everywhere. And, and it's something that, you know, some high income countries have done in the past and then stopped doing. Um, uh, it, it It's just difficult to do it without, I mean, there are sort of, it's difficult to do it without sort of um, adverse kind of con like unintended consequences. Um, you see a lot of donor work, which has come with, you know, we'll, We'll pay you money if you simultaneously strengthen the emis and um you know try and you know recognize better performance um uh, and and again it's about i think a lot of these speakers have been talking about you know building the teams that um kind of can themselves look at sort of country country priorities and uh, kind of maintain the emis to, to address country priorities i guess um i mean one of the i'll shut up soon but one of the biggest issues is you know, in, in some countries with with the sort of learning crisis, you're talking sort of, you know, I think, and you know, most children, you know, have that crisis, and then, and then the, the difficulty is, well, what what do you do with finance? Um, how do you how do you recognize, you know, outperformance? Um, um, and you can do it without finance, of course. There are different ways to recognize, you know, great performance. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Maybe I want to push this a bit more with colleagues who worked in the health sector, how, you know, there's maybe results based financing is maybe more popular or more accepted. Um, Knut, if you want to come in or our colleagues from HISP, uh, Sophia and Prosper to comment on your experience with similar models in the health sector and why or not, why not that is translating into the education sector. Uh, yeah, I, I think I can take a shot at it, and uh, and and I think you do bring out something that is very critical as uh, we are into this uh, image shift and all that. Um, so um, what you actually bringing out is really going beyond funding numbers uh, to find to funding, you know, performance. Uh, uh, and also uh, output outcomes of, of, of our education sector. Uh, and, and, and it comes at a time when we even see that uh, currently in the education, yeah, and, and, and it has been clearly uh, shared by all the countries that they are really using the data for public financing. They are using the enrollment number and so on. But even what we see currently in education is that even the enrollment numbers are not funded adequately. So uh, again, you're pushing it a little bit further up, but um, what we see in the health sector is um, it's not all about numbers. It is the out the, the the service delivery, the outcomes, the outputs that you know come out of this. And so, uh, in the education in the health sector, you will find uh, this uh, performance uh, based financing, uh, which is over and above the bare public financing for a, a given health facility. So what the, what the, the education has, the captation grant is what we have as the you know, public health financing uh, finances for the, for the health sector. But beyond that, you really want to you know, be able to promote and fund for better outcomes. And so this is an area where now we need to go beyond the numbers, you know, like, you know, these are the enrollment numbers and even look at the quality in terms of what the school is produce, producing and so be able to allocate funds 
based on the financing. And this could be either in both the negative way or the positive way. In a negative way that, you know, whether the poor for performing schools should be really taken good care of to be able to improve. While if you want to, you know, if you've really been uh, level funding for your numbers, then you want to, you know, reward or award the best performing schools. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Prosper. Any reflections from panelists on insights from Prosper? There is a question from Kahal. Is it not much more difficult to identify outputs, outcomes to be funded in the education sector compared to health? Yeah, maybe I can uh, take a shot. Um, well, of course, of course, uh, when we <clears throat> talk about um, cure or, or you know, birth or 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 death, even um, that is r really sometimes very easy to measure. Um, not always, but um, so 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 to some extent, it's true. All, but but on the other hand, the education sector is really geared towards measurement of you know of uh, acquired learning right and uh, not uh, certainly not always uh, maybe wonderfully accurately I and mean, there's a lot of criticism uh, but, but 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 we do have a really well institutionalized um, numbers that come out of, of performance of students on exams and and, and also throughout the school year uh, or, um, so so it should be possible, but from my perspective, uh, we are not. Uh, in many countries, it's not it's not yet there at the national level. There are certainly many schools that have you know uh, uh, systems in place, uh, and also national examination boards are are in place. But to bring this really to that level of granularity, we 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 first need to sort of. Um, uh, crawl before we can run uh, in terms of information about the individual students. So, so as soon as you have that in place, uh, in, in even even in the more remote schools, then then you can institutionalize uh, various measures. And I, I like what I think Hannah's presentation is saying that you you don't actually have to cover each and every school. And I think I think there's is definitely some truth in that that you can actually achieve. Uh, you can you can. Um, you can um, make a lot of progress in, I don't know, half of the schools or 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 sixty percent of the schools, um, and and uh, and and that that's all can already drive reforms in terms of how you can uh, incentivize uh, schools to do better, and and uh, hopefully that could then be taken to to help those schools that that are not yet ready. Um, yeah, I think, but I don't. I don't really have a very clear uh, experience with this because we are still building the infrastructure to to be able to collect all of this information. Yeah, I certainly think um, more is more is possible on this front, and I think um, I think once you once you have, I mean, as as Nut says, you know, it's, it's that is that, but once you've built that infrastructure and once you sort of have those, people often think that it's really comes down to the the, the data platforms. In reality, all of this work boils down to, um, you know, government structures, you know, like staff capacity, uh, you know, clear um, governance processes, um, and and making sure that um, that those that that kind of nuts and bolts of of day to day um, public administration are in place, and and once that's possible, um, it, it really just comes down to figuring out the right solution um, and often having a little more ambition than there has been historically. Um, and that's something that I think is really important because, you know, we're, it's, I think in many cases, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, it, it's inspiring to be with this group today because, you know, it's 2024 and, you know, this is people talking about the importance of moving beyond um, and actually doing the legwork of moving beyond annual census exercises. Um, which just collect aggregate data. You know, this is um, a group of people who are who are sort of driving driving that, um, and it's, it's it's really 
uh, really promising to see uh, the work in East Bettini and, and South Africa as well. Um, so thank you for those those presentations. Uh, but yeah, I think certainly once you have the, the learner profiles in place, once you once you start just having the ambition to to try and count learners that individually, um, then the logical next step is is learning outcomes. I mean, these these systems are already collecting exam data and managing exam data nationwide every year. Um, there is there's no reason to not have all of that joined up um, and, and to be doing this systematically going forward. Thank you very much, Hannah. We have only two minutes left. Um, to finish on an inspirational positive note, Newt, maybe just a few words on how you're leveraging staff capacity that we already have in the health sector to build up education sector data systems. Can I uh, let Prosper answer that one? Because they're really yes. doing it well in Uganda. Yes, please. Prosper, would you like to come on? Yeah, thank you very much. And 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 uh, this is just uh, from the ex uh, from the challenges that uh, were mentioned from South Africa. Basically, capacity uh, building is one of the key to any information system, um, uh, and this is also for the EMIS. Uh, and this is what, for a long time, for over now now three decades, we've been really looking at. You know, building the capacity within the government and the sub-national levels to be able to um, uh, support, maintain uh, any, any, any implementation. And so uh, we've run quite a series of uh, trainings at the global, uh, regional, and national level, and then uh, most and sub-national level, and in most cases, countries have been trained. And uh, in the governments, what is very interesting, in most of the government systems, there is this rotation of staff from, you know, you can be today in education and next day you find yourself in, in, in health and next day you find yourself in agriculture. So um, at that level, the capacity that we have built within the Ministry of Health is already supporting the education because some of the IT uh, staff are being rotated around. So when we come to education, they already have that kind of skills. And then later on, when we take it down to the sub-national level, uh, the sub-national level structures are really, really uh, very um, uh, concentrated in one place. And so you find sometimes one staff is cutting across the different departments, which makes it very, make the statistician is cutting across different uh, um, uh, um, ministries or governments at the, at the district level. And so once you've trained this one person, you can be able to serve across the entire uh, planning unit, or you find that they are located, co located in the same uh, location. And once they have challenges with either data analysis, interpretation, sharing, extraction, and, and, and use, they are able to consult each other in that kind of level. And also takes it down to the level of the, of the school and the clinics. These are also almost co-located in the same area. And the fact that we have already been able to train the health staff, this can also be, the, the education team can also benefit from that. Once you have a platform that is commonly used across these different sectors. Does. And it has played very well when we came to the monitoring of the government, uh, the monitoring and, and evaluation uh, for the for the government in the office of the prime minister. We are now almost every sector has a knowledge of DHIS two, and they can be able to apply it wherever they go. Thank you. Thank you, Prosper. So good to hear how you're leveraging skills development and transferring that over to education sector. Unfortunately, we are out of time. This was incredibly interesting. Thank you so much for your time, for the presenters and also the audience for engaging. The chat will stay live for a few more minutes um, and the recording will be available online. Thank you very much. Please do stay in touch.